Christ Central, we're glad to have you here today. Uh, a couple of announcements. Uh, the nursery will be available if you have a child in need, uh, birth through preschool age. The nursery area is located just outside the back door, uh, first hall on the left there. The kids can move out to Kid Central during the song before the sermon. I'm trying to see how loud this is so I know if I'm singing, if you can hear me. So <laughs> I, I back away from it. Uh, Kid Central during the song before the sermon. Uh, thank you to Laura and all that helped this week with the Vacation Bible School. Uh, glad everything went well. Uh, this week is food pantry week. The truck will be unloading and bagging Tuesday about 9.30 a.m. So if you would like to be here to help with that, be here a little before 9.30. The distribution will be Wednesday from 5 to 5.30 p.m. And if you've helped with that, to be here a little before five for that so uh and i don't know of any other announcements we had a, a good crowd this morning men's breakfast we were blessed to have mayor joe taylor come and speak to us so thank you for all that came um mitchell you're up next marty yes. marty has something i'm sorry i didn't see marty Finance meeting Tuesday at 5.30. Thank you. She was reminding me, I think. <laughs> Y'all text me, okay? <laughs> um, this morning for our uh, ministry moment time, what I wanted to do is give um, a shout-out and offer a little bit of a reminder. Um, the shout-out is about VBS. Um, last week... Uh, as Jeff mentioned, we had VBS, and it looked a little bit different this year. Um, and a lot of that was because we did a lot of things that I think were intentionally designed to try and engage our community. Um, we had the movie night the first night, we went to the factory the second night, and then we had our lock-in here on Wednesday night. Um, and a couple of things about that that I think are really cool, first and foremost, Laura, as always, did a great job. A lot of hours spent planning, a lot of hours of preparation. And I think everything went as well as it could have, even though, as she'll tell you, the factory kind of forgot about us for a little bit and uh, they had to shoot over and, and let us in. But um, she did a great job. And I think one of the things that was really cool about our VBS was it gave us an opportunity to invite, not only invite people to our church, but a chance to go out and go to people having the movie night here at the church parking lot, having us go to the factory. These things are things about us going and not always asking people to come to us. We went to them instead. And so um, it was a great week. I enjoyed being there when I could. And for those of you who helped, I know it was very appreciated by Laura and by the kids. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, the reminder that I lift up is our food pantry is this week. Um, Sharon and I were kind of talking before the service about the confusing with the calendar and how it might have slipped up on some of us that it's this week but the food pantry is one of the most important things that we do here and I know that we've all noticed uh, how things might look at the grocery store cost wise the shortages that we have of things going on and so our food pantry really does a lot to help the people in our community who are feeling that even more than some of us might be feeling that. So if you're available, if you're not out of town, if you're getting back from being out of town and you want to stop by the church to help out with that, I know that it would be greatly appreciated and it means a lot to a lot of people in our community that they have somewhere to come and talk to people who care about them and get some food and other things while they're here. Um, so we'll be looking forward to doing that Wednesday and for all of you who are available to help to stop by and help us serve our community and help provide for some people in need. Uh, but with those things being said, let's stand and worship together this morning. Before we move into worship, uh, Finance Committee, are they meeting this week? Yeah. Tuesday. Tuesday right? at 530. Okay, good. Just making sure. All right. Buried so aimlessly, life filled with sin. I would let my dear Savior in. And Jesus came like a soldier in the Sorrow inside. Praise the Lord. 
the blind man that God gave back his sight. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Fool to wander and stray. Straight is the gate and narrow the way. Now I have traded the wrong for the right. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. We were waiting without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died pray
and the morning that you rose all of heaven held its breath till the stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born then the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel shall not faint by his blood and in his name in his freedom i am free for the love of jesus christ who has I love that song, King of Kings. I almost started off in a bad way this morning. I turned on the TV to catch the news, and I was on uh, the movie channel, Turner, Turner Classic Movies, and they were showing the movie Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> That's a horrible way to start today on Sunday. So, thank you, David, for King of Kings. It's, uh, I, turn, I turned that thing off. It, it just got, it was not good. The Bible scripture for the morning is from Romans chapter 5, the first five verses. And on the screen, you have the NIV. Uh, last night, I read five different translations of those five verses. And I'm always surprised at how the King James Version, which was written 500 years ago, how the language has changed in that time. And I found a New Living Translation that I'd like to share. If you follow along, whether you're in King James or NIV, whatever, from Romans 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into his, his place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently, joyfully look forward to the sharing of God's glory. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us to develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. 
and this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. I've been reading a book lately that is, is just a delight for me. It's, uh, it's called Holy Humor, and it's written by, published by Guidepost Magazines. It's uh, a book that contains holy humor from around the country and uh, from a group called the Fellowship of Merry Christians, and it, it's a happy... It's a happy reading of God's word in humor. And it's baseball season. The Braves are playing. I saw a bit of the Yankees on TV yesterday. Baseball season is here. And I saw this morning that it's National Little League Baseball Week. Uh, and in my book, I found the baseball psalm. And as I read it and pray it, I hope that you'll read it with me, either silently or out loud if you wanted to. But the baseball psalm. The Lord is my manager. I shall not quit. He maketh me to run in green outfields. He leadeth me along the strong base paths. He restoreth my place in the heavenly lineup. He leadeth me in reading life signals for his name's sake. And though I walk up to a lineup of devilish pitches, I will fear no strikeout, for thou art with me. Thou dost promise me a bonus in the presence of mine opponents. Thou anointest my sore spots with balm, my locket runneth over. Surely my statistics will be forgiven me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the eternal hall of fame. Lord, I thank you for this psalm. I thank you for this church. I thank you for this congregation and ask your blessings on all. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand with us. Splendor of the King, put the majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice trembles at his voice how great our god sing with me
of you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay in my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. said amen you may be seated uh, in case you haven't noticed it's trinity sunday did you notice all the trinity songs that david was playing good job david way to roll that right up just in happened. there just happened, just happened. Yep. <laughs> that's how it normally just happens for us i'm so grateful this morning, I do want to talk to you about is it something I don't usually get that deep into theology, but, but this morning, I, I would like to get a little bit deeper into the theology of the Trinity for you. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about it. It's something that's hard to express. It's something that we always hit a ceiling on of understanding because we try to figure out how the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are in relation with each other, and we're talking about something divine. And we're very human still, so it can get difficult to understand. Um, there are some, there's some simple facts that we know about our church, 
right? A simple fact is that we're a very conservative church. Does everybody know that? We're traditional. Oh, we adhere to the discipline, that the, the way that it stands right now. Okay? These are very true things about us. And I think we need to be sure that we make it known to everybody that walks through the door. Okay? Just so that people know who we are. Now, when I talk about the Trinity, uh, it's a Christian idea, and, and this Christian idea of the Holy Trinity, it's a derived idea. It's derived from reading the Scripture in its entirety, okay, and trying to figure out what exactly it's telling us. And it's, it's a way that we interpret the Bible, not necessarily through our own understanding, but through a guided understanding of the Holy Spirit. And so last week I talked to you about the Holy Spirit. Now I'm going to go through all three of them, okay, and talk to you about all three of them. It's not really, it sounds like it sometimes when I talk about the Trinity, that it's some kind of theological insider talk that's only meant for all the good Christians that understand it, and that's not what it is, you know. It, 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 is, it is a way of understanding God and what is, what is God calling us to do and what is he calling us to be? That's, that's a good way to understand it when we take a look at the Trinity. And as we go along, you'll see more and more what I mean about that. Best way to start into it, let's pray together. So if you'd bow your heads, join your hearts. We thank you, Father, for giving us hope. We thank you, Son, for giving us refuge. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for continuing to protect us. Lord, it is through our love relationship with Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you in unity with the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever, we lift up this prayer in humility, giving you all honor, all glory, and all praise, Almighty Trinity. We pray. Amen. So uh, the reading this morning is coming from John 16, 12 through 15. I love that little icon up there. It really helps me see the Trinity strongly. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear to hear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth, full and complete truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but he will speak whatever he hears from the Father, the message regarding the Son. And he will disclose to you what is to come in the future. He will glorify and honor me because he, the Holy Spirit, will take from what is mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Because of this, I said that He, the Spirit, will take from what is mine and will reveal it to you. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, hard as it might look, you won't, if you continue to dig through the Bible, you'll never see the word holy and Trinity together in there, anywhere. It, it won't happen like that. Uh, it, what the church teaches about the Trinity is what we call a derived doctrine. That is, if, if you read the Bible with discernment, putting together such passages as the one we just read from John, with other passages, we conclude the manifestation of God and these three unique personalities. Okay? That sounds like a lot of church talk. Maybe I ought to get, get a little more simplified with it. For instance, the last few verses of Matthew where Jesus tells his disciples to baptize people in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit leads us to believe, to come to that logical conclusion that God is triune, that there are three distinct entities or, or personalities that are there. But... At the same time, that God is one, inseparable, right? And, and those two assertions don't contradict each other. They don't contradict each other. Although a lot of times, other people, when they look at Christianity, other, other belief systems have a hard time wrapping their head around that. People have naturally asked whether the Trinity refers to three different gods or one God with, say, three masks or addresses or personalities or aliases? Or is it a divine committee with a president, a vice president, secretary, treasurer kind of thing? 
You know, I've heard all those descriptions of the Trinity, by the way. Uh, maybe it's, it's simply, uh, maybe it's just this. It's a doctrine that we've designed to keep all those people from thinking that they know it all, right? That they know they don't know it all now. No, it's not that either. In the end, much about the Trinity is shrouded in, in a mystery for many Christians, but also for many outside the faith too. You know, we're monotheistic, and so are Jewish people and Muslims are monotheistic. They believe in this one God. Uh, both Judaism and Islam are insistently monotheistic, but they are not monolithic. And what I mean by that is, is that all Jews are not on the same page theologically, and neither are all Muslims on the same page theologically. Uh, but Christians, of course, are on... No, we're not on, always on the same page theologically either. Uh, we're, we're all tenaciously monotheistic. And we're all theologically divided at times. All of us. However, the divine essence itself, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, it cannot be divided. It cannot be separated. About a decade ago, there was a theologian and teacher from Yale Divinity School, uh, Mar Maroslav Wolf, or Wolf, Wolf, wrote a wonderful book. It was called Allah, A, a Christian Response. It, it, was a, it was to answer a question on whether Christians and Muslims worship the same God. And the answer was definitely yes. They worship the same God. But to defend that answer, he had to confront the doubts of Muslim scholars about the Trinity because many of them believed that Christians worship three gods. They worship the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they were all three separate gods. Uh, over quite a few pages of deep theological reflection that I won't bore you with this morning, okay? Wolf drew some clear conclusions about them. And here's what they are. First, to divide the divine essence in any way is to slip into some type of polytheism which Christians theologically reject. All of us. Right? And two, every act of one person of the Trinity is always caused by the entirety of the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are always all together on whatever action they take. Okay? And the third one was to say that there are three persons in God means only that there are three eternal, inseparable, interpenetrating agencies. In each, the other two are present. And in each, the single divine essence is also present. That is to say that they all are of one essence. That's why that picture, the third one down there, has God in the center, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit surrounding it. Right? Because they all are of the same essence. As, as we think about the Trinity, uh, try to imagine what it is and why it might make a difference in your Christian walk. Why would it be important to you? I think it's important, first of all, to set down a general rule that, that might help us a little to understand this great divine from our human perspective. This is the rule. The persons of the Trinity never work at odds with one another. They're always together in harmony on every decision, on everything they do. It might seem like a silly point, but it becomes crucial when we try to understand what Jesus was doing for us on the cross, okay? If we don't understand what Jesus' part of that was, it's difficult. For example, some people have proposed that Jesus' suffering is death. It was an example of some type of divine child abuse. Well, well, that's just silly, but if the members of the Trinity never work at odds with one another... That statement simply doesn't fit, does it? Because they're never trying to hurt each other. They're always trying to encourage the same thing, the same growth for us. So just who is this God in three persons? 
And, and what can we say about the three persons of the Godhead and how each of them are God's revelation to us about his divine identity? Let me say that another way. Each part of the Trinity reveals God to us in a way that's unique of that part of the Trinity. But all of them reveal God to us. And that's as simple as I can, I can make that statement. Well, God is the creator. Uh, a great 20th century theologian, Paul Tillich, he, he called God the ground of all being. And I like that statement, the ground of all being. And, and, and that's been a helpful image for many people along the way. In the beginning, says Genesis, the creator, God, who already existed, created the heavens and the earth and all that was in it and on it. Right? And, and the question pops up, how did God do this? Through words. That's why we have to be so careful of our words. So careful of them. God spoke the world into existence. It, it does it like this. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God said, let there be this and let there be that, right? And it happened, right? And this is uh, how everything was created. So just looking at that, we realize the power of God's word. It is a creative power that can speak things into existence. When we say we're going to pray about it, and we have the glory of God with us in that prayer, we speak what we're praying into existence. I want you to wrap your heads around that for a minute. And that'll show you a little bit about God, what he's given us, and the power of prayer that he's given us. He's given us the ability to pray his power into our world. We, we should affirm that this highly complex and carefully orchestrated universe is, is a big clue to what God is like. You know, and what does that mean? It, it means that there's beauty, an awesome beauty, within the tiniest of atoms and molecules. And then there's this uncommon, awesome beauty in the greatness of the cosmos. So from what we can't even see to what we can't even miss is God. And he teaches us through that creation who he is. Author Annie Diller describes it as a God running off on, an, on a creative tangent that results in a bazillion kind of butterflies and six bazillion kinds of insects and birds and more stakes than you can shake a stick at to say nothing of the thousands and thousands of galaxies and DNA strands that are so long and complex, it simply takes our breath away. This is the creative power of our God, God the Father. Dillard concludes this, and I, I love the statement. God loves pizzazz. He loves the colors of the rainbow. 60 bazillion different kinds of insects. You know what I'm saying? So God is a creator. God reveals that. Just as God has also revealed to us in the Son and in the Holy Spirit. As, as the John passage we read today suggests, God calls to us through each person of the Trinity. Each voice that we hear is just a little bit different. And, and it's a little bit unique. And each plea is uniquely stated to us through either the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit in David talking to me, or the Holy Spirit in me talking to you. It's that powerful of an existence. But, but the goal is the same. God wants our hearts to come home because where our hearts are completely defines what we treasure in this world. What we put our hearts in. That defines what's important to us. God wants to give us transformed lives now and the gift of eternity in the Lord's 
healing presence. What he wants to give us. So, to deliver this message that Jesus Christ has died for your sins and he saves you and you can have all eternity in his presence and in his love. See, God does not depend simply on, you know, the snail mail letters in the Bible, which took 2,000 years to get to us today, right? Although everything that's necessary for salvation is in that scripture, and it should be enough, that's not the only way God talks to us, is it? He talks to us in many ways. No, God phones us, he emails us, he texts us, he sends out personal messengers who one was himself. He showed up incarnate as Jesus Christ. And God, and God makes the divine presence available to us through the Holy Spirit. Each person of the Trinity is an avenue for God to reach us to reach out to us, to touch our lives, a channel of God's grace. In turn, each of us can not only access the Trinity ourselves, but we can also share it with others. So we can access it in our times of need, right? And we can share it when others are in need too. God is always searching and calling out for us. Religion is often defined as this, humans searching for God. Uh, but Christians do assert kind of a different take on that. The take we assert on it is God searches for us. He's the one that loved us first. He's the one that sent his son. He's the one that comes to us through the Holy Spirit. He's before us. He's behind us to our right and left. He's the one searching us out. Not only through the message of creation, or the sense of God's spirit in our midst, but also through God's incarnation of Jesus Christ. He comes and reaches out to us and says, come back to me. I love you. I want you to come back to me. So if God's natural creation is one way of reaching us, teaching us, calling us to commit our hearts, then Jesus is another way. And the Holy Spirit is another way. Right? The third way. And God speaks. But we must try to listen and see what he's speaking into our lives. So many times we just go through our lives and we say a lot to God, but we never really take the time to listen to what he's trying to say to us. And guilty, guilty is charged, you know? And the Holy Spirit, the third way, but God the Father calls to us through creation, God the Son calls to us through his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection. Jesus shows us how to live, shows us how, to, how that he himself is life and truth. And then God the Holy Spirit calls to us by connecting to our hearts today and every day, by convincing us of our need for a Savior, by reminding us of who God is, by regenerating us and preparing us to receive the forgiveness of God through Jesus Christ. Reminding us of what Jesus said. Reminding us of what Jesus de has done. Reminding us that we are his. And he is ours. As Jesus said in the passage we read today. The Holy Spirit will take what is mine and declare it to you. So there's no separation between the two or among the three. They are together in this task. Being Trinitarians is, is not an easy theological position to maintain, by the way. You already heard it took theological debate to convince Muslims that we only believe in one God, right? Uh, it's, it's, probably easier, it's probably easier to kind of take up a Unitarian kind of theolo theology. Let me explain what I mean by that. A Unitarian kind of theology would do this. If you were, if you were to uh, just take the first person of the Trinity, you could get so attached to the creator and the creation that you forget that what Christ has done for us and that the Holy Spirit is calling us to be whole and free through Jesus Christ. If all you're thinking about is creation and the creator or or let's take the second person of the Trinity. 
It will be someone who's so focused on Jesus and a theology of salvation and redemption that they have little room in their heart for the free movement of the Holy Spirit. Right? Or even a rightful place of God the Creator. This is a type of person that can't see God in the flight of a bird or in the wind blowing through a tree. Right? A Unitarian or the third person would be someone so in touch and in love with the more sensual gifts of the Spirit, such as speaking in tongues or, or interpreting tongues or, or you know, uh, dancing. Or, or They would be so caught up in that, there would be little room for God, the Creator, understanding how creation speaks to us and tells us about God, or understanding how Jesus has saved us and speaks to us about God. So all three are necessary. You can see how picking one out might lead us in a spiritually unhealthy direction. That's why we're Trinitarians. That's why we believe this way. This kind of third-person Unitarian might insist that, that all Christians, well, first of all, all of them have to be baptized and they have to come up speaking in tongues. They have to all be ecstatic and have those ecstatic experiences in in church. Well, I know from experience that sometimes people just sit there and cry and there isn't anything ecstatic about it except for what's going on in their hearts and in their relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And that's what's ecstatic about it. But that's no different than the person who gets up and speaks in tongues or interprets in tongues, right? Those things certainly have their place in a fully developed Christian life. But if they constitute the whole of one's theology, then they become out of balance. We need all three to be in balance, right? Trinitarians have this balanced theology. That's what they have. They experience the call from God in different ways, and they say yes to each one of those calls. They show that they are grateful for the gifts that they've been given, grateful for the forgiveness, for salvation, for the model of discipleship that Jesus reveals to us. If we spend our time merely arguing about how many members of the Trinity can dance on the head of a pin, then we're not only wasting our time, we're wasting God's time, right? If we worry too much about what the church down the street thinks, then we're wasting not only our time, but we're wasting God's time, right? We have to be strong in what we think and what we believe. Not so strong that we hurt other people, though. Not so strong that we can't forgive. Not so strong that we can't try to understand what's going on. But strong. It's only when having understood how God calls us through each person of the Trinity, we in response can give our lives to God. And, and that makes sense to me. So let's remember that we're Trinitarians because that's how God has chosen to reveal himself to us as God, one in three. God is creator, redeemer, sustainer, father, son, Holy Spirit. As you leave this place and seek to be a disciple, I need you to take the time to listen to the call. What is God calling to you as the creator, reminding you of this, of this one thing? Don't forget to take care of the creation. He put us here to do that. Right? Then to listen to the call to you from God the Savior saying, love one another as I have loved you. And to listen to the call to you from God the Holy Spirit saying, I am always with you. Always with you. And in response to the one in three, may we always say yes. Yes, Lord, yes. Yes to all three and yes to the one true God to whom be all glory and honor now and forever. I pray that we are able to glean something from this this morning. I hope that you're able to take something with you. May that be so in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Could I have the ushers come forward, please? As a forgiven and reconciled people, let us offer our tithes and gifts to the Lord as an act of worship. Holy Father, I do ask that you bless the giving of these tithes by the power of your Spirit, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. May it be so. Amen. Thank you, Jim.
May we stand, please? I do want to give you this benediction. I pray this for you. I pray God is in every moment of your time and everywhere you are, to your right and left, above you and underneath you, in front of you and behind you, and you're rising in the morning and you're going to sleep at night. I pray he is in every moment of your time, everywhere you are. What I pray for you this week is that you have that ability to see God in creation as the creator that you have this ability to see God as the Redeemer and Savior as in Jesus Christ and the grace that's given through that, and that you have the ability to experience God as the Holy Spirit and the Trinity all comes together for you. May that be so. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you, thank you. Hmm.